from out of the stars. A beacon of light beckons humanity forward, bringing a message of scientific understanding, creative expression, and exemplifying love in action. Greetings again from Unarius. This uh, officially opens lesson number two. There are lots of people in the world today who know the existence of many things but are unable to describe them factually and in a way in which people can understand them. That is the purpose of Unarius. Last Saturday, uh, you might be interested to know that the I was very sure and positive after we re-run uh, the tape transmission home that Leonardo da Vinci was the master who attended that part of the talk. We have a tape recording. In fact, we have several of them from this master from previous transmissions, and we know him quite well. Uh, in the future, various other different scientists, masters, and teachers will come in and overshadow and give the necessary information. Tonight, as we will not have it said that you will be, go out into the world with any particular topic, our subject, which is relative to the existence of mankind in the terrestrial dimension known as the Earth, whereby you cannot talk intelligently and enter into such discussions as will be worthwhile to the general purpose and service of mankind. It is very obvious, as it was mentioned last Saturday, that the world is in very critical times and we have long since come and gone beyond that point where mankind did need a new philosophy, a new understanding, and a new purpose, a new something. There have been times like that in the past, and we have seen in the course of history and in the transition of these great cycles that there have appeared avatars and masters as moderators of the various essential spiritual ingredients which were necessary for man to exist. Primarily and instinctively and within all of us, we are quite aware that we are not necessarily creatures of circumstance or desire. As it was gone into somewhat in the Saturday discussion that the world today is torn between what we will say two factions of expression. The more ancient fundamentalisms of the past, which have been in existence for at least 2,000 years. In this country, these various religious, theosophical, occult organizations number something in the neighborhood of 9,000. These are all basically derivatives of ancient or semi-ancient philosophies and religions which have come out of the past. 
We also have a very advanced material science which deals completely with the scale of atomic weights in the elements as they are known, which we have about a hundred. To the scientist of this day and time, the old ancient religions are more or less, shall I say, fairy stories. A scientist is concerned with testing reactions, reagents, catalytic elements, and so on, and test tubes, retorts, and various other paraphernalia which is found in the laboratory. Energy becomes a manifestation which pulsates on the screen of the oscilloscope. There's nothing happenstance or happen chance in the life of the scientist. Formula is proven and reproven definitely and beyond question of the shadow of the doubt before it becomes accepted tenure of the scientific mind. Therefore, to the scientist and to the, well, I say they died in the wool scientist, the hard rock core scientist, the philosophies, whether they are Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, or whatever other concept, it is possible to conceive that these things are in themselves legendary in nature. It is not because the scientist is not religious in nature. In my own relationship to the scientific world, I have found all scientists very deeply religious. But I have found that they are religious in a different sense of the word than the Christian. Physical science, too, is not without its faults, not without its shortcomings. But if we remember that the physical science that we have at this day and age has been in existence primarily and for the most part for less than a hundred years. Pasteur has only been dead 58 years. And as you know, much of the research work in pathogenic bacteriology was given by Pasteur. And so it is with many of the different branches or phases and concepts of science. And while they themselves deal primarily in a reactionary nature with the 100 elements, the thing which is missing in the present day physical science is the acceptance, the working into, and the relativity of man in particular with the spiritual sciences. Heretofore, and up until the present time, this has been primarily the task of some highly developed clairvoyant or medium. These things may have been taken into consideration into such spiritual channels as the spiritualist churches or to such various and different obscure demonstrations to individuals or groups throughout the world. We have also other groups which are known to the world in the field of parapsychology. We're all familiar with the work which the Rhines at Duke University did for about 35 years in ESP cards to see whether man did have these senses in any sort of a usable or functional form. There are various other psychic research organizations that are doing considerable work along these lines. However, as far as the fundamental Christianity is concerned, it resides today in just about the same shape that it has been in for many years. It is torn and twisted and distorted from within itself by various infusions, concepts, derelictions, and distortions. Jesus himself gave a very simple, straightforward doctrine, a doctrine which was based primarily upon the inner concept of man and his existence with his planets. As we all know, it was not until the reign of Constantine, the Roman emperor, and with the Milan Edict and various other things which came into existence some 200 years after the death of Jesus before Christianity became legal. Until that time, it was open season on Christians. Uh, if we look into the history of Buddha, and that he too came and went upon the earth, and it was not until the reign of King Asoka, 235 years later, before Buddhism became known outside of the province in which Buddha was born. 
Zoroaster was not accepted in his own community and lived and died unknown. And he even tried to go in other sections of the world and to teach the people what he had thought. But it was not until 150 years later before Zoroastrianism became a generally accepted theology in the land of Chaldea. Starting somewhere back into the past, uh, we may say first that, paradoxically enough, that it is the Christian himself, the Orthodox Christian, who knows the least about his religion than anyone else. Even the outsider knows more about Christianity than the Christian does. Now, the reason for this is very obvious. People always, as we say, water seeks its own level. People will eventually find a level of intelligence upon which they function best. That is the law. That is the own innate and creative desire within every individual. The Bible has been the translator and the paragon of all virtues for mankind as far as the Christian is concerned. And basing his entire life upon the concepts and extractions from the Bible, he has sought to rule and dominate the pagan world. If the Christian was sufficiently enlightened in the doctrine which he professed to know and to try and teach, and would go back into the course of history, he would find that Christianity had its roots and was nourished in the soil of occultism in the Far East and in the Near East. Starting as we may, about 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus, to the time of Abraham, living in Chaldea, Abraham was a reformer. He was not satisfied with the various types of derelictions which were being practiced by the various priests in the different temples at that time. So Abraham set out to do something about it. One of the first things which converted a large number of people to the way in which Abraham thought was sort of an astronomical phenomenon. From somewhere out of the sky, a meteorite came crashing out of the heavens. And so it was that in the passing years, Abraham led the Israelites out of Chaldea to pick up their trail some five or six hundred years later in Egypt. And with the appearance of Moses and the story in which we are all familiar with, leading these people away from slavery and captivity into the promised land to build the new city of the Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon and set forth all of the doctrines and all of the teachings which were given to the people of that time. The average Christian does not know that the meteorite which fell at Abraham's feet was and is to this day in the inner citadel in the city of Mecca. It is the duty, the right, and the inborn desire of every Muhammad to go into that citadel, and he believes and knows that he will not go to heaven until he does so, to walk seven times around the stone, the black stone of Abraham, and then to kneel and kiss the stone. The Christian points his finger at the Muslim and cries, Pagan. And the Muslim points his finger at the Christian and calls, Infidel. While the Methodists, the Presbyterian, and various Catholic orders and other denominations of fundamentalism are sending missionaries over into the Eastern world to convert the heathen, the heathen is sending missionaries over to the Western world to convert the Christian. One of these missionaries who was incidentally very successful in his efforts and came out of India was known as Paramahansa Yogananda and established more than 700 self-realization centers in the United States. Yogananda passed on to his reward, I believe, in 1950. Yogananda compounded, among everything, and as he was a very learned and intelligent man, some of the Western science, some of the Eastern occultism, and perhaps some of the more acceptable and really realistic the psychologies and various other expressions and tenures 
of learning. And so it is, and as it resides today, that the weaknesses, that the schisms, and the various factions which are in existence and which give rise to so much confusion in the everyday life and the existence of the average citizen, the seeker, you people are fortunate. You have at least one, path, one foot upon the path of truth. But there are many on this outside world who do not have the advantages and the opportunities which the innate inward desire of your own selfhood has led you into the light of this truth. I'm not necessarily speaking of this service or of these lessons, but of the constructive thing in which you are yourself. The lesson, the message of all of the great avatars of the past have been one simple, easily understood doctrine. And as Jesus so aptly expressed it, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, which is a thing, and all things shall be added unto you. It is the purpose of Unarius to explain what the inner kingdom is, what its function is what it is composed of, what it does, how you are connected to this inner self. Up until now, there has been little, if any, available knowledge pertaining to what might be called the spiritual world, the world outside or the dimension in which the scientist calls space. Space to the scientist today is a rather a vague and an insecure concept in which is constantly being subjected to different changes. One day he may think it is shaped like a saddle, and another day it is circular. Einstein himself went into the most abstract of mathematical formulas to try and conceive within his mind and the objective mind what the dimension of space really was. And that is not an answer which can be given in a mathematical formula. It never has been, and it never will be. Space and the concept of the spiritual worlds in which all things reside in its entirety, and all of the substance and elements in the infinite sense and in the abstract formation of what we call God, is so completely abstract that it will have to be visualized, it will have to be assimilated, not in one lifetime, not in one progression, but in thousands of progressions in lifetimes. 